Hi everyone, my name is Wasim Al Sindi, and uh, I'm the managing editor of the uh, new Crypto Economic Systems uh, journal and conference series. And so uh, I'm based between the MIT Digital Currency Initiative, which is a, a research group based at the MIT Media Lab, and the MIT Press, which is a mission driven nonprofit scholarly publisher. So um, I tried to make this talk quite short, so I'm going to jump uh, straight in. So. Um, one of the places I always like to start when uh, framing a conversation, especially about something like scholarly communication, as is the subject uh, when we're talking about uh, journals and conferences, is uh, the difficulties that humans have to communicate. So, you know, we're humans and we've been humans for millions of years, and the way that we choose to communicate is through small mouth noises, which we enunciate by pursing our lips and, you know, tongues and, uh, and all the rest of it going in there. So in order to have a conversation, a pair of humans, like for, between a pair of humans, there needs to be basically two translations need to take place. Uh, in my head, there are some neural impulses. We don't know where they come from yet, but let's uh, skip that for now. I don't convert those into small mouth noises. The recipient or, or the person on the other end of the conversation or the YouTube video, hears those small mouth noises and they have to decode what they mean using language, semantics, context. Also nonverbal cues, you know, people moving their hands around, eye contact and so on. Uh, so this is actually very difficult and uh, we're still really bad at it. So um, here's a meme right just behind me on the screen. Um, a, balac a balaclava, wearing a balaclava while playing balalaika on black lava. So obviously those words look and sound quite similar, but they clearly mean very different things, as you can see from the picture. So sometimes we have words that are very similar, that have uh, similar sounding, that have different meanings. And we have words that have very different meaning, different sounds that have the same meaning. And of course, we're conduct I'm conducting this conversation in English, which is just one of countless languages on planet Earth. And there's always um, context and uh, uh, local customs and uh, different variations from place to place. So um, th we're already starting. The point I'm trying to make is we already start from this very challenging uh, 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 commencement point. So uh, to help us communicate more effectively, we can use things like conceptual frameworks to uh, try and uh, uh, leverage abstraction, to try and make things uh, simpler to understand, to use different differential discretization, to um, tear apart the similarities and tease apart the similarities and differences of different things, or to use these frameworks to help us define things um, more precisely than without them. So what we've got on the screen here are a series of kind of stacks of layer, sort of uh, stacks of layer representations, I call them meta stacks. And so these aren't re representing anything real in the sense that say an OSI, uh, a networking hierarchy framework is trying to do something quite concrete. This is more of a kind of a metaphysical um, exercise where we, for in the left hand example, we're taking a, a blockchain network or any kind of peer to peer uh, type cryptocurrency type network and we're teasing it apart into these kind of meta layers. And uh, this is building on some work that was done by uh, Vitalik Buterin in 2017 in an article called The Meaning of Decentralization. And uh, we pushed this forwards in the token space paper a little bit further to uh, add some extra, um, uh, add an extra layer to, uh, and then to use these layers to invoke some, some attempts at definitions of, of certain kind of sticky or semantically muddy words. So, uh, for example, one of these words is immutability the resistance to change of something. And you might uh, be able to define immutability as a primarily a logical and protocol layer phenomena, whether we're talking about uh, data structures or we're talking and, and the transaction ledger, or we're talking about the code base of a particular implementation of a network. You can talk about uh, decentralization on a particular layer. For example, you could say that monetary decentralization maps onto Gini coefficients, so token distributions. You could say that social and political decentralization maps onto uh, governance or the lack thereof. <clears throat> and if you continue abstract to ad absurdum, you arrive at this uh, kind of what I call ontological metastack, You're kind of zooming out and out and out until you're arriving at this kind of, um, you know, li it's, a, it's linear, so it's not a perfect model. Uh, I, I would say that something that's uh, semi-open or semi-closed, like a spiral or a, or a dag would probably be better, but um, it's a very helpful, simple model to understand how the evolution of complexity of fields um, gives gives rise uh, uh, to to yet new fields and yet further ones. So um, back in the times of Aristotle and, and his, his compatriots and his colleagues, contemporaries, uh, there was only national natural philosophy. Uh, things are not yet discretized into uh, disciplines and, and and fields with with theories of knowledge and epistemic traditions. Um, and then from there, I suppose you could say mathematics and logic and number theory uh, grew out of that. And then from there, we start to build. Uh, frameworks to understand the universe, things like physics, chemistry, 
biology and then we go to social sciences complex systems and then who knows where we go and each time we go things get more complicated and we also seem to tend towards subjectivity a bit more although interestingly enough if we keep going down to the bottom the bottom and we get to a sort of subatomic uh, uh, particles quantum domain we end up in heisenberg uh, uh, territory we end up in Planck territory and things start to look a bit subjective again so uh, max tegbock noticed this and so I called this ontological metastack a subjectivity sandwich uh, in reference to, to, to some of Tegmark, Tegmark's ideas. Moving on, um, let's look at the state of things today in this uh, cryptocurrency world and uh, spe specifically with reference to, to scholarly publishing and, and uh, academic journals. Um, so it seems that like we've ended up in this very unhealthy situation here where we have a very small number of um, ol uh, oligopolist um, uh, Multinational corporations, uh, you, know, you heard, may have heard names like Springer, uh, Wiley, Nature, Taylor and Francis, Elsevier. Um, we have this kind of uh, Pareto power law kind of situation where we have this, you know, half dozen gigantic monolith publishers. And they kind of act in this kind of block or, or pseudo cartel where they um, uh, maintain very high profit margins. They maintain... Um, uh, Quite restrictive intellectual property domains over authors' work, copyright, and stuff like that. Um, you're in the situ kind of crazy situation, which has been going on for a while, where um, publicly funded research, for example, most of the research in Europe is in universities is publicly funded, uh, will get published in a privately owned journal, and the people that wrote, did that work will then have to pay to look at the paper they published. Um, unless some other special measure is taken. So that's obviously crazy. So some of the hot topics that are going on in scholarly publishing at the moment, people talk a lot about preprints, the idea of publishing things uh, on, a, on a staging server before they've been peer reviewed. And now this is something that's really hot. There's been a big debate over this. But what's interesting is in the months since I first gave this talk, um, the coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, a phenomenon, an, an epidemic, pandemic even, has uh, swept the world. And I think, um, it, people have really woken up to the use of having this rapid publication dissemination pathways um, because it's not we don't have time to wait months or years for um, the traditional kind of glacial peer review processes to take place, multiple rounds and all the rest of it. Uh, we actually need some information, even if it's quick and dirty, even if it may not be verified or it may not be 100% accurate. It's more useful to have that now and let that work go through the validation process uh, in the fullness of time. Uh, we also have this kind of over metricization problem where um, universities and, uh, and the kind of um, knowledge industries around them have built all these metrics to understand how high quality a piece of work is by using uh, citation metrics and uh, view, view numbers and all these other kinds of things. The problem is we, when we're using these objective frame uh, metrics very heavily and we rely on them, we create a situation where things can be, um, these metrics may not be great measures of, of the kind of uh, uh, underlying uh, attributes we wish to to, to be um, uh, uh, accessing um, and you have this big problem of uh, what's called Goodhart's law where once a measure becomes a target it ceases to be a good measure because it can be optimized for it can be gained so you see a lot of uh, work with um, a lot of uh, related uh, phenomena of things like self citation where researchers will often cite their work a lot to bump up the citation numbers what's also interesting is a citation metric doesn't in take into account context so somebody might be citing a paper because they disagree with it or they think it's very poor quality work or they might be citing it because they agree with it and they think it's very high quality work. And so things like um, objective numbers, like um, citation metrics, like uh, uh, pure numbers like that that don't give any um, kind of uh, uh, metadata or context as to, which, uh, as to the, the reason or the basis for the citation are also not that helpful. So we already spoke a little bit about peer review. Some people say it's too slow, it's unnecessary, it's broken. Um, to paraphrase uh, uh, whoever it was, Churchill or Gandhi, I can't even remember, maybe both. Uh, peer review seems to be the worst system that we've got apart from all the others. And so this kind of peer-to-peer -peer human verification that peer review is, is uh, quite slow, labor intensive, and it's not particularly well rewarded. We'll get onto all those things in a minute, but it does still seem to be one of the best things that we've, we've got uh, uh, right now. So um, open access is a very interesting one. So I have a background in open source, like so software and media. And uh, for me, the, the words open access should map onto open source quite closely, or at least onto kind of the most permissive Creative Commons licenses. What we've ended up in the situation now is that 
we have these different kind of variations of open source, uh, for open access rather. Um, some of them have been um, uh, pushed by some of these legacy publishers as a way to be seen to be doing open access, whereas not really, it's not really in spirit of, of what open access is intended to be, in my opinion. Um, and so we have these kind of green and gold open access systems, which are not really open. And then you have the kind of platinum diamond open access, which is a bit closer to open source Creative Commons. And uh, that's what we'll be using for crypto economic systems for, for our up upcoming journal. People talk a lot about APCs, article processing charges. So this is the idea that if um, the reader isn't paying for the work, then somebody has to foot the bill. The journal has expenses, somebody has to foot the bill. So the idea of an APC is to charge the submitting author um, it's like a lottery ticket. You buy the ticket and you might get desk rejected in 15 minutes, you might get published uh, you know, after uh, peer review and publication. Now, so this seems quite unfair from an economic uh, perspective. So some people have been uh, campaigning for the unbundling of publication economics. So you could imagine, very coarsely put, the, the, so the journal process being uh, submission, review and publication. Those are your three phases. So you could have separate um, fees for each of those. As your work progresses through those, you could pay the necessary fee to progress. Now, um, it's probably best to have an element of flexibility in these publishing models because different um, kinds of researchers have different funding uh, sources and those funding sources may or may not include the facility for these publication fees. So having flexibility is always good. Um, I'll talk a bit about predatory journals uh, towards the end. This is an interesting uh, new uh, phenomenon based uh, in part on the fact that Open access journals are so easy to set up that anyone can set up a journal, say it's peer reviewed, uh, get some like fudge, fake, gain some pu uh, citation publication metrics, make your journal look like it's a worthwhile place to publish. And because of the prevalent over metricization, publish or perish culture that we've got in universities, uh, at least in the developed world at the moment, people are quite desperate to publish. And so they will publish, um, even if the journal uh, raises a red flag or two, they may still be uh, feel motivated to publish there. And of course, these uh, predatory journals are taking uh, submission fees, uh, submission charges, and that's their business model, essentially. So it's very, um, not all predatory journals are the same. Some are doing, some are better, some are worse. Some are doing the review. Some are just saying they did it and didn't do it. Uh, there's a lot of kind of made up names and funny bios and headshots of random people on these websites. So please do your due diligence if you're suspicious about a journal. Um, I may be a predatory publishing person. Who knows? I mean, our journal doesn't take any fees for publishing, so it'd be very hard for me to, to predate. And um, the MIT Press is a mission-driven, non-profit, scholarly publisher, which doesn't really have pub predatory tendencies. But you should make your own minds up. Please don't trust, but verify. So uh, rights transfer, very often um, authors lose their copyright. They sign that over to a journal. Now we want to be as close to open source as possible. So we've uh, asked the MIT press and they've agreed that we would only take a non-exclusive license to anybody's work. So the authors retain control of their work and the rights to their work. And we would just ask for um, first uh, refusal uh, to publish that. So we'll be the first to publish it. Uh, but we are very happy to see the work uh, either interim or final stages on preprint servers. We welcome that and more on preprint servers uh, a little bit later. So I very much recommend the three articles which you can see uh, at the bottom of the screen here. This is uh, by Monbiot uh, in The Guardian, Scientific Publishing is a Ripoff. There's this excellent long read in The Guardian from a couple of years ago called Is the Staggeringly Profitable Business of uh, Scholarship Scientific Publishing Bad for Science? And this goes into the history of, of where commercial publishers came from and how they outcompeted and outgunned the scholarly publishers where everything started, things like the Royal Society, uh, American Medical Association, uh, um, IEEE and all these kinds of things. And there's a great article here called 10 Hot Topics Around Scholarly Publishing, from which I've picked out a few of the, the things um, at the top of the screen. And the things in blue are the things that we're looking to address. So preprints, peer, like re-engineering peer review, using open access and uh, maximize, uh, minimizing the, um, the rights overhead, the, the, the rights requests from from the authors. So um, let's introduce crypto economic systems a bit more now. So I'll tell you a bit about myself. I've been in post at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for approximately 10 months now. And uh, as soon as I started, we got to work uh, really on um, making the journal a reality. So a lot of groundwork had gone in by the editors in chief, uh, Nehan Ruler, Andrew Miller, and another gr and a group of people around the MIT Digital Currency Initiative. Uh, some advisors, uh, which we'll get to later, and some other colleagues. 
really trying to understand kind of the pain points to open questions, what's missing in terms of scholarly infrastructure and what, what might we be able to do to help. So as soon as I joined, we started building a peer review committee. We started organizing a curated conference. Uh, we then recently completed our first peer reviewed conference where we did a call for papers. We, we, we got some submissions, we reviewed them. We chose a, a conference program and we're about to publish a subset of those papers in our first uh, journal issue, which is uh, coming pretty soon. So let's get to the why. Why set up a new journal? I mean, um, uh, there's plenty of conferences out there and there's plenty of um, um, computer science journals, economics journals, law journals. But what's missing is a place like a dedicated place for cryptocurrency, for the way the intersection of the, the, the principal component fields that go into uh, cryptocurrency stuff, blockchain stuff. So we're talking about the kind of technical and engineering fields like protocol engineering, distributed systems, cryptography, mathematics. You could even say thermodynamics if you look at proof of work. Um, and then the kind of the more uh, epistemic, uh, uh, social and higher order fields, the higher layers of that meta stack I showed you earlier, where we're talking primarily economics, as these things have monetary, the monetary networks, you could say, uh, where the rubber hits the road and these things meet the real world. We have regulatory policy and legal um, unanswered questions and, and things to explore. Um, and then you also have like a, a, a great deal of philosophical questions around uh, the nature of these things, these tokens, these assets, these networks, and also like um, how we can um, concept, build conceptual frameworks to, to characterize, to understand, um, to get to the bottom of what these things are, the kind of the, the ontologies of, of all these things. So um, we're trying to build this big tent. That's what we try to do. And MIT has a reputation of doing this to try and be the kind of neutral uh, place where we can bring uh, together, bring people together that may not uh, meet or talk so often, may not work together so often, and try to build a set of shared best practices for how we can move forwards together to synthesize the insights from these different constituent component domains, these traditional epistemes, into something new, into a, this new field. And so, um, this is some interesting work done by uh, Jason Potts and Ellie Rennie from uh, RMIT in Melbourne, where they're trying to, well, this is work from a few years ago, which they presented our, uh, our Crypto Economic Systems Summit in October 2019 at the MIT Media Lab. All those videos are on the Crypto Economic Systems YouTube, which you can find by, by uh, Googling. And if you just Google a journal as a club, uh, Jason Potts, Ellie Rennie, you will probably find the, the, the video. So the idea being here that there's an economic theory of clubs where we talk about uh, whether um, access to the club and the goods contained within it are rivalrous or not, whether they're bounded or not. And, um, and so, you know, the membership of a journal club is voluntary. It's not anonymously crowded, so everybody kind of knows everybody. It's exclusive in a way uh, because you either have to be asked to participate or you have to apply by submitting a paper, um, or you uh, get a job working on the journal. I applied for a job and I got a job working on the journal. Uh, it's globally partitioned and it's rationally constructed. So this is just kind of saying that journals are a bit like a guild or a, or a, um, or a society, and like a microcosm of a society. And the shared good is mutual attention to an idea. So the real point of journals is to help ideas spread. So if we can verify and validate these ideas, they may become a part of best practice of our of the new field that we're trying to mint. And so um, here's a really nice PetriNet visual uh, uh, flow chart of how a, a journal might work, like an autonomous tokenized journal. And this is from uh, the Decentralized Technology upcoming journal uh, run by uh, Statebox people, uh, Yellow, Fabrizio, Fabrizio and also Andrew Lewis Pye in uh, London, Jason Teutsch, uh, from Truebit is also involved in this and we've had some conversations with them and I really enjoy um, looking at the way that they're framing the problem, looking at the way they're conceiving uh, this project. It's a little bit different to ours as we'll get on to in a minute um, but I very much uh, encourage all these experiments and we're, we've got a keen, keen eye on a lot of these. So um, back to crypto economic systems. Um, this is a little bit of the uh, human story, the human uh, uh, part of the, the, the engine that is uh, uh, CES. So we have two uh, editors in chief, Nehan Narula, who's the director of the Digital Currency Initiative, where I work, and Andrew Miller, who's an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and he's an assistant uh, associate director of uh, IC3, Institute for 
currencies, contracts, and something else. Forgot about that, sorry. Um, and so I'm the managing editor, and I also work with Ashley Jacobson, who does a lot of the uh, event planning and administration work. Now, we uh, seek a lot of counsel and advice from uh, our um, advisory board, uh, which is con comprised of uh, 12 uh, very eminent researchers, scholars, and practitioners in the field. So um, these go from people like Dan Bonet, who's done all the crypto stuff at Stanford, Shafi Goldwasser, who has a Turing Medal for Zero Knowledge Proofs, Dalia Malki is the lead researcher at Calibra, um, and so on and so on and so on. We have people from the Ethereum Foundation, from uh, Bitcoin Core. So we're trying to mix academia and practice, economists, regulators, lawyers, uh, cryptographers, and engineers. And so, uh, as I said earlier, we had a conference, in um, an invited conference with, with uh, 60 curated uh, talks and 225 attendees. Uh, we covered all the continents, so we had a very um, uh, high uh, carbon load from the conference, but it was very nice to, to build the big tent and bring people not only from different fields and different epistemes, but from different corners of the world together to try and help us um, uh, crack the, the big problems, to understand what the, the biggest priorities should be as we um, look to, to um, move forward with this project. And so, yes, please uh, go check out the videos. They're all online as well. And um, it's a huge range of stuff from domain specific stuff to kind of how to do knowledge aggregation, propagation, how to uh, run a journal and, and so on. How to do crypto economics in practice, how to do uh, looking at uh, uh, cryptocurrencies from a policy perspective. So, yeah, really interesting stuff there. And uh, this is uh, breaking, recent breaking news where a few weeks ago we just finished our uh, first peer review conference, Crypto Economic Systems 20, which was also held at MIT, not, not at the lab, but another part of campus. This was a two-day peer-reviewed conference program that we co-located with the MIT Bitcoin Expo and seventh annual running of that uh, event. Uh, we took uh, different uh, places on campus so we could practice uh, the social distancing, which is uh, so uh, in vogue in this uh, uh, a part of the COVID scene that we live in. And so all the videos are online now, so please uh, search for Crypto Econsys20. That's also the Twitter hashtag if you want to look at the um, social media coverage. And there's plenty more information about the journal at cryptoeconomic.systems, which is our um, website. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, our call for papers, the first one that just passed, give you a little bit of a look underneath the bonnet of, of how a, a journal uh, type organization might work. So we're obviously still setting this up. So we're still learning as we go. This is like a big experiment and we fly by the seat of our pants. So fortunately, we haven't crashed yet. And um, we've had a few uh, wonky turns, but we managed to keep, uh, keep in control and keep uh, pushing forwards. So we had a, a call for papers for the conference just passed, this May, May 20 uh, uh, Crypto Economic Systems Conference. And uh, we opened that in early September and we were going to close it in late October, but we, we pushed it, uh, the deadline for, further a little bit more to encourage a bit more participation and to get some more papers in. So uh, deadlines are the most powerful motivating force in the universe, as anyone uh, uh, watching this video can probably attest to. Um, and so we only got really got a lot of visibility on the call for papers at the deadline. And that, by that point, people were rushing and scrambling to finish their papers, but they couldn't get them in time. So we allowed a little bit of a grace period. We ended up with a huge increase in submissions. We 4 x our submissions from around 20 to around 80. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that um, one of the, the, the bigger conferences in this space that's been going for over 20 years is called Financial Crypto, FC. And so unwittingly, by extending our, our deadline uh, for three weeks, we uh, ended up being, the revised deadline ended up being slightly after the author notifications for financial crypto, uh, which meant that people got their feedback as to whether their papers were accepted or rejected um, before uh, our deadline. So a lot of people turned around, presumably those that weren't accepted, and also submitted to our journal, so uh, to our conference um, uh, call for papers. So one of the concerns we had was that we would end up with a lower quality batch of papers. Uh, however, what seems to have been the case is uh, we ended up uh, ca catching a lot of quite high quality interdisciplinary papers that were maybe not the, the FC was maybe not the perfect venue for, or at least not yet. So um, then once we got all these papers in, then it came to uh, analyzing them. And so uh, we uh, engaged in our first peer review season uh, we had 42 members of our program committee who did an excellent job uh, reviewing these papers under very difficult uh, circumstances with a truncated peer review period over Christmas and New Year. And so from the 80 paper submissions, we ended up accepting 26 of those for the conference and a subset of those nine also for the journal, for the 
for an inaugural issue, which is coming soon. And so we targeted three reviews per paper and five, and that would translate to five reviews per PC member as 64 papers went through to review. We desk rejected 16. Um, and one thing we learned from this experience is that matching the papers to the reviewers, that is one of the challenges that we, um, we have. Some reviewers want to see a wide and uh, diverse range of papers outside of their expertise, and some don't. So we still, we're still learning how to, how to best do this. And so at the very bottom, you've got what um, is uh, the, the review portal we use is called Hot CRP, Hot Crap. And what you see here is what you can call, oh, to get that out of the way, what you can call uh, what they call the procrastination chart. So this is um, the amount of time until the deadline versus the number of the fraction of reviews completed. So what you can see in our, on, our, on the left, it's, it's um, crypto economic systems. And on the right, it's financial crypto. So we can see we have this kind of like bi biphasic uh, distribution. Um, where we had two kind of big uh, pumps, where uh, uh, one of them around the true deadline, one of them around the optimistic deadline before Christmas. With FC, you can see that they had like one big rush around the real deadline. But what's very interesting to note in both of these cases is that the uh, deadline is little more than the midpoint. So if you set your deadline to when you need your papers, you're going to have a bad time. And that's something I've learned the hard way. Uh, so um, yes, not going to do that again. Okay, so one of the other really interesting things that we started seeing in the data after we got all of the, the reviews back was what you might think of di as disciplinary bias. So when a, when a reviewer reviews a paper, when a program committee member reviews a paper, we ask them to give a score between one and five, depending on whether this is like a reject, a weak reject, an accept, a weak accept, an accept, or a strong accept. And so you're kind of grading from one to five. What we noticed is people from different fields or from different backgrounds use that one to five score quite differently. Uh, we found that people from more technical fields were a little bit less generous with the score, shall we say. And so we end, ended up having to calibrate our scores a little bit more to try and adjust for uh, the, these kinds of uh, variations. And just to do a sanity check to make sure that some papers weren't getting a much harder time than others because of the, the nature of the reviewers and their um, uh, preferences when they they're scoring grading preferences and also to make sure that, um, that we knew when certain reviewers were giving overly generous or overly stingy uh, uh, feedback compared to the the mean and the median the norm um, so that's something also we we uh, only really realized we had to correct for the 11th hour now we're much more attuned to it so this is something that will get easier with time so I want to talk a little bit about interdisciplinarity. So this is one of the key, um, the key things that we're trying to do here. We're trying to reach and connect these kind of disconnected epistemes in the, in the, in the um, research ecosystem. Like so ec economists and mathematicians may, may not talk to each other very much. They may use different uh, um, terms. They may use different phrases. They may have, they have different publication cultures. They have different an incentive alignment to engage in interdisciplinary work versus work inside their episteme. So this is something that's really uh, quite a challenge. And um, one thing that's that, that, that really stood out for us is the variation in publishing cultures between different fields. So for example, law reviews are very much run by, almost all run by students. In economics, if you're a US uh, academic and you want to chase tenure, you pretty much have to publish in one of the kind of half dozen monolithic journals that's existed for 60, 80 or 100 years. It may take you several years to publish in there. And in computer science and related fields, reflecting the fast paced move of these technology driven fields, um, things tend to get published and disseminated through conferences first and then published and bundled together and published as proceedings. So it's a challenge to make these things mutually legible and to find a way that we can become credible in these different fields so that what, what our researchers contribute to this interdisciplinary commons is also incentive, uh, like recognized in, and is incentive compatible with their uh, kind of career trajectories and quests. So this is a really nice picture from uh, Harvard Bioinformatics Lab, I'm missing the uh, credit there, MC Escherina in the bottom. And uh, I like this picture because it sums up uh, a lot of what interdisciplinarity really is trying to do, the logics of interdisciplinarity. So on the left, we have molecules, in the middle, we have cells and receptors, and on the right, we have silicon. And so the idea is that we're trying to form this kind of continuous spectrum between all these different 
fields, approaches, disciplines, reservoirs, and fundamentals of knowledge, uh, epistemic um, uh, epistemes, and ivory towers to try and find a way that we can network and connect all of these things together so that we can uh, learn from each other in a, in, a, in a more rich sense. And this is one thing that I no always noticed in my uh, prior research career when I was always in the interface of fields between physics and chemistry, between astronomy and chemistry, uh, between biology and physics. And so um, this interface uh, dwelling is a very rich place to be, and it has been for a very long time. And it, you can also map this to kind of the Kuhnian concept of uh, paradigm shifts, uh, uh, Popper's three worlds, and, and, and all the rest of it. So more on that in my uh, token space work, which uh, is uh, located elsewhere. So uh, this is a kind of funny slide, this escaping the gravity funnel. And the reason I put this in is because we're trying to to not fall into this wormhole of being perceived as an all singing, all dancing MIT project that's uh, for MIT's benefit and glory alone. What we're trying to do here is build a piece of scholarly infrastructure for the benefit of the commons. So most of the people that review the papers are based outside MIT. Most of the advisory board are based outside MIT. Uh, I'm based several thousand miles away from MIT. Um, and uh, of the two editors in chief, only one of them is based at MIT. And so we're trying to push this thing out into the community. After we built it, initiated it, trying to push it out to the community, kind of decentralize uh, this thing. And that's a necessary uh, precondition for it to survive and thrive. Because if it's perceived as coming out of one institute and being dominated by one institute, then it'll be very hard to gain credibility uh, and um, uh, make sure that everybody feels that there's a level playing field. So let's talk a little bit more about interdisciplinarity. So um, you know, you might imagine a network node map where each of the dots is a is an episteme or a, or a field. So interdisciplinarity is kind of the edges between the nodes. You're interpolating between these these areas. You might consider uh, multidisciplinarity as, as simultaneously occupying more than one of these nodes, and you might consider transdisciplinarity to be existing on a kind of a separate meta plane or a separate uh, dimension, uh, transcending these nodes and these edges, uh, but somehow still drawing uh, drawing from them. And there's some uh, nice papers linked uh, or, or screenshotted here, which I, I quite like to refer to, especially the epistemic trespassing paper by Nathan Ballantyne, who's a, an epistemologist at Fordham University, and so. Uh, he has this interesting idea, and I can just sum it up from the, uh, from the abstract. Epistemic trespassers judge matters outside their own field of expertise. Trespassing is ubiquitous in this age of interdisciplinarity, and recognising this will require us to be more intellectually modest. So, in my opinion, we're all trespassers now. We're all judging matters outside of our expertise and discipline. Um, I, I'm more so than arguably anyone, as I'm trying to connect all of these different technical and, uh, and social scientific fields within which I have absolutely no training. So maybe that's good because I'm not weighed down by this epistemic baggage of a particular ivory tower uh, the, the, or a relevant ivory tower in this uh, in this scenario. Or maybe it's bad because I'm a, I'm a, a ignorant fool that doesn't uh, understand his lack of uh, uh, training and, uh, and how that impacts uh, ability to pass these things. You will have to be the judge of that. So. Again, we spoke about this career compatibility, the, the seeming disincentive for being an inter interdisciplinary uh, actor, whereas uh, somebody that, that is maximizing their um, actions for a tenure would probably not go down these risky side avenues. They'd probably stick to more tried and tested, uh, normal uh, science, as, as Kuhn might call it, or uh, status quo research, let's say. Um, it's also an argument that it's there's less tolerance in certain aspects of, of research, both inside academia and outside, for doing this kind of anti, into, inter, multi, transdisciplinary work. It's also arguably harder to fund, although this situation is probably getting a little bit easier with time as, as the, the value of interdisciplinary work increases uh, or the perception of the value increases. So uh, let's talk a bit about peer review. Um, so publishing culture is very across fields, as we said. That also means that peer review practice is very, very across fields. And so um, the notion of academic service, this idea that academics should put in work to, to the benefit of the ecosystem in their field, is well recognised and, and, and that's been around for a very, very long time. Uh, however, there's not the same uh, recognition of it in um, outside academia in practice, with the possible exception of this rise of, of big, tech, big tech research programmes 
think about like Google research, Microsoft research and, and so on. Um, the researchers based there, especially the senior principal researchers, seem to have more bandwidth for academic service than a lot of academics that I seem to uh, interact with, which is quite interesting. So that's an interesting inversion which may be taking place there. So uh, one of the things that we're trying to do, one of the contributions we're trying to make to, to, to peer review is to open up the, the, the process a little bit, or at least the outputs of the process. So we would like to do, and this is something we've started to do with the first outputs from our peer review process for the conference, um, to synthesize review summaries from the comments the reviewers made and publish those alongside uh, accepted papers to give uh, some rationality for the decisions, the, the outcome of, 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 that, of the peer review, and also to highlight and foreground some of the interesting uh, points raised in the work, uh, opportunities for extension, uh, critiques, and so on. And that's so far been very well received by uh, most authors because it's, it's an opportunity to help them develop their research, get some real kind of in de detailed expert judgment on that. And so yes, I mentioned open peer review. So the idea being that if we have an open output from the peer review process, I mean, you could even open up the whole process in due course, um, the idea is we want to encourage conversations to carry on. We want to encourage greater transparency, wider debate, and set higher standards. So we have to remember that in the field of cryptocurrency, people are pretty much printing their own money. So if you're printing your own money, you expect to be held to a high standard of account and you know to undergo some reg rigorous validation and verification. And that's what this peer review process is meant to do, to validate, verify, and also disseminate the uh, findings and the outcomes of that. We're still finding our way around this, so we're very happy to hear any uh, suggestions, comments, critiques you might have of the processes we're using as well. So here's an interesting concept that we're working on, which uh, we've been calling peer-to-peer -peer review. Also, people might call it retrospective peer review or mercenary peer review. The idea being that we can go look for papers to review in this kind of overlay journal format style. The idea being we can go back in time, we can go to any field uh, and pick out papers say something from 30 years ago that was a cute piece of sci-fi then, but seems to have predated and predicted a lot of what we see in uh, computational marketplaces or um, the thermodynamics of uh, proof of work and mining and so on. So there's papers that were so far ahead of their time that people didn't really grok the impact and significance back then, or that so much work has been built upon them that um, the, the original underlying work has taken on a new uh, set of meanings. So we're interested in, in revisiting even like papers which um, have been studied to uh, arguably to death. So things like the Nakamoto paper or uh, Harbour and Stornetta's work on timestamping or Lamport's work on um, distributed timestamping and uh, you know the Byzantine generals problem. So all of these things were um, of their time, but as uh, you know, in the fullness of, of, uh, of uh, the years intervening, uh, they've taken on a new set of significance and context. There's also an opportunity to address, set the record straight if things were found to be um, uh, incorrect or, or there were subtleties or nuances which weren't considered. We can then layer those, uh, layer upon those, um, and uh, errors in proofs, models, and, and mathematics, and so on. So let's talk a little bit about the, the interaction of academia and practice. So one very interesting thing about the cryptocurrency field is, as we all know, this thing did not come out of academia. It's specifically very much the opposite. No, the key papers were posted to random PDF servers by either pseudonymous people or people outside universities in the great in the in the um, uh, for the most part. Now, um, the other interesting thing about this is when you look at Bitcoin itself. So Bitcoin is this very kludgy uh, solution to uh, a very serious set of problems. You know, uh, time stamping, double spending, and and, and so on. But if you look at the um, individual components of Bitcoin, let's say, you know, the blockchain, Merkle trees, peer-to-peer -peer network, consensus, fork chain rule, and the economics of the subsidy, each of these seems to be suboptimal uh, in itself. So you could imagine a great deal of um, uh, easy, low-hanging fruit to improve any one of those uh, particular um, elements. Now, of course, if somebody goes away and improves one of those elements and then publishes that work, then that's great. But they improved it. So that means that, you know, if they wanted to build a cryptocurrency, they would still be building it. And then that's uh, different to Bitcoin, which is obviously leaderless and, and the, um, the progenitor or progenitors seem to have disappeared uh, a long time ago. So the other thing to, that's interesting about um, 
uh, academia and practice different in terms of differences. It's a very distinct approaches in philosophies. And I would even go as far as to say is there's also like a little bit of mistrust or misunderstanding between the two. And that's something we're really trying to, to help bridge. So uh, cryptocurrency developers seem to be a bit skeptical of academia. They do much of their communications in back channels like IRC, Telegram groups and so on. And like academics don't seem to be that, that you know, much involved in those uh, uh, types of conversations. Uh, academics tend to be very thorough, move slowly, that's where their incentives are aligned. Practitioners tend to be a bit more moving fast and, and possibly breaking things. Now, I'm sure everybody watching this video is aware that there's a great deal of structural and ontological problems in universities, like what is the point of a university in the point post-digital age? And that now we're here in the COVID scene in March 2020, uh, where all the universities are moving online. So then you have to ask yourself again, like, what is the point of a university? It, it, you know, it seems that many universities look more than um, uh, credential factories now and so even the kind of physicality of the of the credentialing factory uh, seems to be uh, uh, crumbling or or, or, uh, or dissipating or, or uh, uh, going up in smoke uh, dissipating uh, at the moment so yes and we'll talk about scholarly service again because I have an interesting slide to show you so um, people have been complaining academics have been complaining about doing scholarly service things like reviewing papers and sitting on committees um, since the 7th century BC, this is a group of Assyrian academics, uh, astronomers, you could say, um, who were complaining that their teaching uh, load was too high. So this is an ongoing problem. It's very, um, very much an eternal problem. So this is something that we're trying to figure out how to uh, incentivize and encourage um, the hard work, the thankless task of peer review. And so uh, beyond the kind of this nebulous notion of service. Um, and so we're very much open to ideas. We'd like to hear from people. There's, there's a work like the uh, Decentralized Technology State Box uh, Journal I showed you earlier, where they're trying to use tokens to do the incentivization, uh, rep constrained reputation tokens. And now there's a talk by Jason Toich at the Crypto Economic Systems Summit in 2019 called A Scalable Store of Reputation, which I recommend you check out. This is a very constrained reputation model, not like the usual kind of problematic blockchain reputation systems, which we um, uh, would not uh, look to implement for quite a lot of reasons. So we're still very interested in exploring that further. We haven't gone down that road yet. Uh, so curious to hear any thoughts anybody might have. Open access. So I just mentioned about open access, so how it maps onto Creative Commons and open source when it's done well. Um, but when it's not done well by, let's say, legacy publishers or predatory publishers, fake journals and so on, then, it, then this kind of uh, pay for play model really sucks. Uh, mirror journals suck. The idea that there's an open access one and a closed access one and the payment model is what determines which one you go into or how it's accessed, the economics of access. Um, open access journals are perceived poorly because of these predatory journals and low quality journals, which is a bit of a headwind for us. I hope that we've managed to, um, you know, now that we've managed to successfully bootstrap our, our, our venue, or at least to start to bootstrap it, we'll be overcoming this, this, this particular uh, obstacle. But I heard in first hand in person from people at conferences who told me, oh, I got the email from you about your journal. I just thought it was a scam because you used all these famous people's names and MIT's name in it, but I'd never heard of you. And so, um, yeah, people thought I was a scammer. I thought people thought I was a predatory editor. Um, so uh, it's probably good that people are skeptical and wary, but it does make it a little bit harder to get one of these uh, publications off the ground. And it can lead to this kind of vicious circle situation. And we spoke about subpub, this unbundling of the publishing economics earlier. Um, and so, yes, there's also this community, Creative Commons and open source a vibe with cryptocurrencies. Obviously, Bitcoin is a, uh, one of the... Um, crowning achievements of open source uh, software and, and engineering more generally. Um, and so to have a kind of closed source model based on like from the field that was minted based on this kind of triumph of open source software seems basically hypocritical. So don't want to be a hypocrite. Thank you very much. And let's talk and, and finish off by talking about a few uh, possible future horizons. So we spoke about preprint servers earlier. Preprint servers are great, but they also kind of, some of them have like a shelf shadow gatekeeping situation because not everything is allowed to go on there. There is a little, a little bit of verification going on. And when there's humans doing verification, then you can bet your bottom dollar that there's politics and, and uh, all the rest of it. So we're thinking of setting up around preprint server. Let us know if you think we should or not. Um, we haven't um, decided yet. We're leaning towards doing it, but it's not an urgent uh, situation. 
We're also trying to understand how we can build concurrent submissions policies. The idea being that if a researcher submits a journal a paper to one journal, they're not supposed to publish it to send it to another one until the outcome has come back. But these outcomes can take months or even years. So we've heard stories of researchers that have built new cryptographic constructions and they got stuck in the peer review process so long that the timeliness of the work and the impact of it had faded by the time that they were able to publish this peer reviewed research, verified research. So um, we mustn't allow that to happen. The um, publishing process must reflect and respect the nature of the field, the pace of it, the trends of it, and the philosophy of it. So um, we're also thinking about conflicts of interest, trying to understand how to do those better. So in the traditional publishing um, an academic publishing system, you usually talk about interrelations between researchers, co-workers, students and professors, uh, and so on. Uh, so that's not good enough here. Everyone's printing their own money. So everyone's got pockets full of tokens. And so we have to understand how to do that better without creating a chilling effect or putting targets on people's backs. So again, I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, Quinn DuPont gave a couple of great talks at our recent conferences, and the paper is going into our first um, uh, the issue zero of Cryptogonic Systems Journal on uh, some guiding principles for and suggestions for ethical uh, uh, research practices and we'd like to use or at least consider some of those in our complex of interest policy. So all ears on that one. Um, we're looking for host organisations to um, to hold um, uh, future Cryptogonic Systems events. This is both curated smaller summits and the larger flagship peer review conference. We'd like to do the next conference in 2021 in Europe, so very much uh, encourage any European institutions that are interested in hosting. Uh, we've already had several expressions of interest, and so we'd like to we'd like to to fill that out some more. Thank you very much. And uh, we're also looking for sponsors to help us bootstrap the journal and uh, to to help us pay the bills. This is how we keep the journal to be the most open access possible. Nobody's paying to submit papers. Nobody's paying to read the papers. Everything is completely uh, as open as we can possibly make it. And so we, we're funding that in the same way that we fund. Um, uh, the conferences and other work at the Digital Currency Initiative, which is through a fundraising drive. So if you're interested in, in being a, accredited as a supporter of this of this initiative, please also get in touch. My email address is, is there, editor at cryptoeconomic.systems. And I just want to finish with a couple of announcements. One of them is that we're looking to bootstrap a new research prize in uh, concert with several other leading conferences in the space. We've got um, Financial Crypto from the IACR, Stanford Blockchain Conference, and advances in financial technology from the ACM. And we'd like to make a committee of committees to decide uh, on a prize for the most impactful research done in any given year. And so we're looking to raise some money to seed that prize and there's naming rights and other benefits available. So if that's interesting, please also get in touch, editor at cryptoeconomic.systems. And uh, just want to say thank you and direct you to our journal call for papers, which is currently open. 